So I'd like to um, welcome you here on behalf of Jewish Wisdom and Wellness, a festival of learning. And the uh, festival of learning is a brainchild between um, the Kalsman Institute of, of um, Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, and Cedar sinai My name is Joanne Tolkoff, and I work with Hebrew Union College and the Kalsman Institute. And um, we have put on a festival of over, over 95 events all across Los Angeles. And the, the goal, the dream for the, for the Cedar sinai and Kalsman was to, be, to share with the Jewish community different modalities, different ways that Judaism can impact our health and wellness. And we wanted to do that by actually breaking down, taking away any barriers that you might have to this so that you could try things that you might not normally try. So we have everything from a storytelling event tonight to healing services this weekend to um, events like this that um, um, combine art and healing and um, autism and sacred conversations. So the week is, we're about, uh, this is hump day for us this week. So we still have another couple of days of events. So I encourage you to um, look at our brochure, go online at jewishwisdomandwellness.org. And um, I also have these postcards that I brought. We have a free closing concert with uh, Nishama Karlbach and Josh Nelson on Sunday. And then on the back side of this card is also all of the healing services that will be going on uh, Friday and Saturday. It's, we, we invited congregations across LA, and so eight has signed up, and maybe there's one in your neighborhood. Um, they're all very interesting and beautiful. I also made a video about it called Refua LA to give you a little bit of idea. So we have videos on our website as well. So, um, and then I'm certainly available to answer any questions. I want to thank the um, Craft in America for hosting mm -hmm. this event today, and Georgia Friedman Harvey for putting together this, this beautiful um, showing. So um, that's, I'm gonna let everyone else go, and also thank you so much from Jewish Wisdom and Wellness for coming mm -hmm. today. <laughs> Georgia for um, bringing us into this event. This really was thanks to Georgia that we found out about the week um, and really was uh, essential to putting the event together. And um, for us, Craft in America focuses on contemporary craft. We do a documentary series for PBS called Craft in America. And um, our current exhibitions are all about craft in the military and all of these in all of these exhibitions there's a major component that I think touches on how art is healing uh, for professional artists um, for art therapy and a whole variety of ways um, I think it's arguable that most art is therapeutic in some form um, so what happened in terms of this these exhibitions we produce an ex a uh, an episode of our series called Service, and it aired last November, and it was various stories about craft and the military. And um, out of that, our executive director, Carol Sobion, when doing her research for it, started um, uncovering all sorts of really interesting chapters in American military history about the involvement and support of the Army for craft, um, particularly since World War II. So our show here today um, touches on some of that history and hopefully starts a dialogue about looking at more of that history that we think is really important and pretty unusual to see how it's entered into things. Um, so these are documents from um, a man named Jerry Gottschalk who heard about our episode and um, let us know that he directed one of the Army Arts and Crafts programs in Germany in the early 60s. Um, the Army Arts and Crafts program started in, uh, during World War II, around 1941. They started um, creating spaces at um, camp spaces all over the world where soldiers could leave and during some R&R &R, create craft. And to us, that's sort of the idea that making an object with your hands has this power to kind of renew you 
and um, become an outlet, an outlet for expression um, and the healing and kind of be a, a, a moment of, um, of peace possibly for somebody. I think it's just really fascinating um, amidst all sorts of circumstances. So um, these are Jerry's uh, photo documentation and other bits of history of his involvement in that one particular program. And these were all over the world and um, kind of a bit of, of history that hasn't really been spoken about too much, but is kind of interesting and gave a lot of soldiers a start in, in the arts. And we know of several pioneers in the studio craft movement who because they had access to craft while they were serving, they then went on to enter into the field as professional artists afterwards. Um, so there's a very interesting mix of um, just a few really profound and um, interesting objects in this show. There's a few, but there's a lot of really powerful stories behind each of the pieces in this little exhibition. Um, because of Georgia, I was lucky enough to connect with an artist in Israel named Ken Goldman who created those amulets in the case back there. Um, those are made of carved stone. The idea for the show was to show objects made by soldiers while active duty. Mm -hmm. And so he made those from stones that he carved while he was in the reserves in Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's gone on and made, continued to make amulets for his children now who've then served in the army in Israel. Um, really interesting guy and that's um, and has a full art practice that is not strictly carving amulets um, but is a much broader practice. The knives in the case actually came to us um, because of Katie. Um, those were made by uh, sailors during World War II um, on ships using recycled windshield material for the mm -hmm. handles um, and that was a practice that um, was had its own little sort of culture which I think is pretty interesting, and there are more knives like that out there in the world. Um, we, we found that this episode and this concept allowed us to connect with all sorts of interesting family histories from people all, all over. Um, the salt and pepper shaker and toothpick holder that you see there are made um, by uh, the grandfather of somebody who works at the National Veterans Art Museum in Chicago. Um, he made them while he was serving their bullet casings. Um, just love the idea of somebody making this kind of, uh, I suppose we need to come up with a new term for trench art post World War I. Um, but somebody thinking to make something like that or those carved hearts while they're serving um, is sort of special, I think. And then, um, so as far as today, uh, we were so lucky to have Jim Cohen come out to join us. Um, Jim has an incredible history that he's going to be talking about in a little bit. Um, involvement with the military and then a second career in craft. Um, hopefully he'll tell us how that comes together. And um, Jim has lent us some of his beautiful and um, exceptionally crafted um, Judaica work in silver. Um, so I think George is going to talk first about her involvement with Dave Fox and his estate, and um, I think Georgia will tell you a little bit about herself. We're a small little crowd. We don't um, need to be too formal here. And then Jim is going to speak, and then Ben Rosenwald is going to share his incredible story for us, too. Yeah. Does the Army still have this craft program? It does, yes. It does. And um, like a lot that's happened overall in the field of craft, it um, definitely has way less funding than it did. Sure. Um, but I think it's because craft has been more entrenched kind of in society uh, as a whole. And when he came back from serving his military um, tours, he is a third generation military and his family, he used the GI Bill and went to, um, I think, junior college first and then USC. And, and Emily didn't mention this, but a really important piece to all this is that the GI Bill really helped to form the art schools and the art departments across America because you had, after World War II, this huge um, return of all of these soldiers who could now go to college with money to send them. And so there's a very deep connection between um, the art schools in this country um, and the GI Bill. 
So Aaron, um, for those of you who don't know him or know him, Aaron found his passion in um, college from an instructor who had been interned in the Japanese camps here in this country and told him, find your passion, find it and follow it. And what he found was that he could make cups. And since 1991, I think he has made over 16,000 cups and given them away. And, and that's what he does, he makes cups. But his cups are so much more than making cups. So I happened to pull two cups that um, I thought really sort of um, framed this talk today. This is Aaron's take and his statement always, peace is the only adequate war memorial. Um, so I feel fortunate, can I safely put this? And this one I still need. And then this cup, which he lent for, um, at AGU we're gonna have about 135 cups and he did 30 honor cups and that is that we gathered names of veterans and current soldiers and he made cups for them. And so he then also gave me lots more cups because Aaron always does that so that you give them away. And I thought, what a fitting kind of statement on this one. It said, veterans are the light at the tip of the candle, illuminating the way for the whole nation. If veterans can achieve awareness, transformation, understanding, and peace, they can share with the rest of society the realities of war. And they can also teach us how to make peace with ourselves so we never have to use violence to resolve conflicts again. And um, it's hard to read the name on here, but it's, um, it, it's a Vietnamese name, um, and the last part of it is Han, H-A-N-H. Anyways, I thought what a fitting, um, for this whole week of um, wisdom and wellness, what a fitting um, thing. So we'll leave these two out so people can see. So what I wanted to sort of talk to you about is the exhibit at AJU really um, looks at the past, the present, and the future of, of the importance that um, unfortunately war has played throughout time, but also that transformation and healing happens. So for us in, in, in our show, we're gonna be looking at um, the work of um, Dave Fox, but also Judy's brother, your brother-in-law was a bomber and he kept his bomber jacket and had a bomb um, stencil on it for every mission he had. And I think that really brings home the absolute power and impact so that every time he had that jacket on, he's reminded of what, what how that transformed his life. And then we also have some letters from um, um, the father of someone who was in World War II and wrote letters to the woman that would become his wife and talked about what was going on. So, But the other person that we're going to include is Dave Fox. And um, some of you may know his work. Dave, um, Dave has an interesting story because he basically got transformed twice. He made it out of Vienna in late 1939 um, after first getting into Belgium after several failed attempts and from Belgium he made it to the U.S. And when he was here, he found out he could become a U.S. citizen if he went into the armed forces. So for him, the armed forces were both a way, a ticket to his new life, but they were also going into the armed forces. But lucky for him, he was sent to the Philippines and Japan. He was not sent back into the European front. Um, and while he was there, he did, um, and let me make my hand do one. He did pieces of art that we discovered after he died um, of, um, of where he was in, in occupied Japan. And we can show you that one. What's really amazing about these is that Dave would come back from the war, would marry, and would use the GI Bill to go to the very early art schools in this country. And for Dave, talking about Vienna, talking about the war, talking about anything was extremely difficult. But how he communicated was through his art. And he that's he wasn't he wasn't concerned with selling it with all the kind of stuff. He just had to just keep churning it out. And he churned it out until literally within the week before he died. And um, if when we went into his apartment um, to help clean it up by his bedside was all of his art supplies. So he intended when he went in the hospital for the last time to still come back mm -hmm. and create art. 
It just was in him, and he was never without a sketchbook. What I think is really remarkable about these pieces is that um, is that the faces. Dave was both. Um, Dave, Dave just couldn't sit still. He was a very quiet man, but he's always had a sketchbook in his hand. He's always doing people, the landscape, lots around this area. But these faces that are in these three pieces did not show up again until just before he died. And at the very end of his life, he did a whole satirical piece on the Jewish home, the retirement home he was living in. Um, and we couldn't figure out where these faces came from. And then when we went through, and I, I worked on his collection for a long time, and I thought I'd seen every piece because I helped move him several times. There were these three pieces that he had hidden away from everybody, that he had not told his family about. And I think they're so poignant because these faces appear again in his last body of work. And I think that really says that he, he you know, and he's framed them this way so you could see the kind of paper he had, his notes and everything. But even though he said he was gonna make this into an etching, he never did. It's like he came back from the war, he tucked them away, and he hid them. Are they ink drawings? Uh-huh, they're pen, yeah, they're pen and ink. There may be a little bit of watercolor in them. It's, it's clearly whatever materials in Japan he could get a hold of. Um, and you'll see um, these pieces that he did at the end of his life, which revisit these faces. Um, we're gonna show them. And I think that that was sort of hidden deep in his brain the impressions that it made. Um, another thing interesting about Dave is he wanted to go back to Vienna in his lifetime as a free man to have an exhibit, and we did arrange that for him. We all went back to Vienna, and he went there as a free man. Interestingly enough, he had this exhibit in a cultural center that used to be in the middle of the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's no longer, and they had been looking for a Viennese Jewish artist to come back and exhibit at that place, and we just happen to all connect. And so these are these powerful moments. These are these transforming moments. These are these healing moments. And so the last thing that I want to talk about is, in Judaism, we talk about tikkun olam and repairing the world. And so our sort of our future for us, um, I also should just mention that also in our exhibit, we're very lucky to have some of Jim Cohen's work. We're lucky to have Joan Pahoyo, who's a photographer. We're lucky to have lots of Aaron's pieces, and we're lucky to have Dave's work, and we're also lucky to have Thomas Dang's work. And I think Thomas is in, is in the craft. We have some overlap, which is nice. So Thomas Dang and a few of Aaron's cups will be at the Craft and Folk Art Museum, um, and they'll be at ours, and Jim's work will be here and at AJU. So I think that that really speaks to the value of us all coming together and looking at this, what goes on in the creating of this art on different levels. But the future then, in terms of tikkun olam and repairing the world, is through such programs as New Directions for Veterans, which is a freestanding program on the BA campus, where they take literally homeless vets, men and women, and they give them an, another chance at life. And there's a foundation, the Mur Philip and Muriel Berman Foundation, that supports um, artists in residency programs at, at, the, at New Directions for Artists. And what it does is it, we, take, we find veterans who are artists, like Aaron Toole and Joan Pahoyo and Thomas Day, and they are the artists who teach, because it's much more powerful for these vets to connect, not with just an artist, but an artist who understands what they're going through. And what I wanted to just share with you was some of their comments about um, what it meant to be in these programs and speaks again directly to me. So I signed up to fill the void of a Monday afternoon. I enjoyed the relaxation and creativity inspired. The process of creating heart helps me relax. The, the photography class helps me appreciate life and helps me relax and ease tension. Today was a good day in this hard walk of recovery. Taking these pictures took my mind away for just, for just this time. Taking these pictures gave me a sense of relief. The process of creating art helps me in a way that my creative mind is activated in such a way to help me relieve stress and focus on the positive side of life. Um, 
And I think that what's really amazing about their photographs that these veterans took is it's all within just the areas around their buildings and that the beauty that they saw and that they were able to stop and they talked a lot. We do luncheons after every set of workshops and we present them with their art. We did a series workshop with Aaron Toole and Thomas Dang where they made cups and they put their pictures and it was really interesting to watch the images that they picked. Some, some had pictures they wanted on but a lot had other memories they wanted to go on them. And then we've done a whole series of workshops with Joan Pahoyo, who was in the Navy, and she does photography with them. And to see them connect with each other, it becomes not just, just this, some of them will tell you, oh, that my, I had to come, or you know, the women will tell you, we all had to come together. But what happens is they get behind this little camera, and all of a sudden the world looks different to them. All of a sudden they get in close to a rose or they get in close here. And even the people who work at New Directions realize how powerful this is because they never, they don't know what they're thinking all the time. And by seeing these photographs, all of a sudden we're seeing how they see their environment and the appreciation they have for their environment. And you have to realize we have, um, in this program, we have everything from, I think that they just got out of the cradle to like 22 year olds who have already gone to war already come back, already have been homeless, and already have found their way to this program. Mm -hmm. So we have all the way from that to we have to um, Vietnam vets. That's about the oldest in the program. But a lot of these vets really are very creative, sensitive people. And I think that we forget on these, you know, we, we make them these tough soldiers that really on the inside, they do it. But if you ask most of them if they would do it again, a lot of them would tell you yes, that they felt that, you know, that they look around them and know that what we have was because we, this is how the world, they don't necessarily agree with it, but this is how the world works. So it's very interesting. And I think for me that most touching is the women are usually the most quiet, but then when we get them by themselves, so we always do a workshop just for the women, they all of a sudden start opening up and talking and most of them have pictures that they want you to see and, and they really begin to realize and that there is still some beauty in the world um, even though they think they've lost sight of that. And we give them at these luncheons two eight by 10 photos. One is a portrait of themselves and one is their best shot. And you should hear them say, I will put these up in my apartment with pride. I'm about to move into my out of new directions and into my own place. These, the first thing I'm hanging is this. I never, this, every time I look at that, I will have faith that there is gonna be a tomorrow. So the whole ability to transform through art is incredibly powerful. And I think these three exhibits that we're gonna have um, really will speak to that. The AJU one is gonna be sort of the most speaking to that because that's our focus. Mm -hmm. But there's no way to look around this room and there's gonna be no way to look around CAPM and not understand how powerful art is and how it has transformed lives. So I'm really thrilled to be a part of this partnership and um, to have these different voices come out in terms of why we need art in anything that goes on in our lives in order to come to a recentering and a transforming into what is possible out of maybe very dark times. So thank you. And unlike uh, Ben, who will be speaking next, and Dave, I'm not a combat veteran. I did serve 21 years on active duty with the Air Force from 1971 to 1992, at the end of one war and to the beginning of a second, one of the longest peacetime periods in the history of uh, the 20th century for this country when we were not at war. And over the course of these years, uh, a lot of things happened about being Jewish. We'll talk about that in a minute. But before I get there, um, every year my family goes back to Washington, D.C. for Pesach. And we have Seder with the same family we've had for over 50 years. And so I was back this year, and in anticipation of this session, I went to the, uh, let me get the exact title here, the National Museum of American Jewish Military History which is run by the Jewish war veterans in a, in a converted house in the DuPont Circle area of Washington. And there I was reminded of the uh, long history of Jews in the military. 
there are we, back to the French and Indian Wars, through the Revolution, through both sides of the Civil War, and through every every conflict America's fought in, there have been Jewish soldiers. Over half a million Jewish men. served during World War II, over 10% were decorated. 20 Jews, over 20 Jews have received the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest award. Excuse me. We have continued to serve through Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Always, whenever there's been a call, Jewish women and women have answered that call. Excuse me. My family wasn't very religious growing up. I was bar mitzvahed, but we never attended services other than the high holidays. My father was the first generation, our second generation. My father was, a crip, was crippled. He was crippled as a high school kid. And uh, when World War II came along, he could not serve. And I joined ROTC in 1967 for the height of the beat on war because of that to fulfill a debt that I felt my family owed this country for the opportunities it provided us. And uh, I was very pleased and honored to do that. And uh, it certainly has led me down the path to where I am today. But uh, being, excuse me, being, being Jewish in the military has never been an easy thing to do. When I was a young second lieutenant in 1972, I was asked by my wing commander at my first duty assignment, what's the story with the beanies, Jim? And uh, I explained as best I could, and he said, okay, that was it. And he was happy that we got on. In 1974, I, uh, was in Spain. This is right after the Queen had reopened the synagogue in Spain, in Madrid, for the first time since the Inquisition. We were invited, we, the military and the Ashkenazi business community of Madrid, were invited to go to services at the uh, high holiday services at this synagogue. When we got there, we were sent to the basement. Uh, we were not Madrilianos, we were not Sephardim. It did not matter who was there. If you were not part of that community, you could have services but there, but you had to be in the basement. We weren't even allowed to look in the sanctuary. Um, you know, that Jewish secular sectarianism exists in many, many areas as time goes by. But the most significant event I had as a Jew in the military occurred early in, in the 1980s out at March Air Force Base. I was the Air Force's Chief Trial Defense Counsel on the West Coast, and I was trying a relatively insignificant case uh, in the greater scheme of things at, out of March, and I called a individual by the name of Dr. Simka Goldman uh, to the stand. He was a psychologist, a reservist, a psychologist, and a rabbi to testify as to the psychological makeup of my client as to why this individual should get a lesser punishment. Dr. Goldman wore a yarmulke, and this precipitated a huge firestorm, far greater than anything I could have ever have imagined. Uh, it ended up in the Supreme Court. And uh, over the issue of whether or not uh, they could be done, and ultimately the uh, Supreme Court decided that the Air Force and the military had the right to restrict the wear of yarmulkes at that time. Uh, but that also was uh, a, I committed an act of nonfeasance in that instance, which has haunted me to this day. Well, um, I went to the, attend the argument at the Supreme Court, and I was in a position where I had to wear a suit in my normal duty. So I was in uh, civilian clothes at the Supreme Court, sitting next to two Army judge advocates, and they didn't know. A, who I was or whatever else, and they certainly didn't know I was Jewish. And one of them said to the other, the only reason this is here is because he's a kike. Mm -hmm. 
and I never did a thing about that. I looked across the room, I saw their boss who I knew, and my boss, both general officers, and I never said a word. And that act of nonfeasance has carried with me uh, as the greatest shame of my military career. But uh, there's never really been, being Jewish was hard because there wasn't ever a Jewish community on a base. I met a total of three rabbis in 22 years in the military, none since 1975. Um, we relied uh, to go to high holiday services on student rabbis or on non-congregational rabbis who needed something, a, a, a job at the high holidays to do it. Uh, the Slack community really manifested itself to me one year I was in, uh, in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, it was Rosh Hashanah, and I, uh, made a Rosh Hashanah meal, roast chicken, apples, honey, manischewitz, the whole works. And I laid it all out on my table, I said all the blessings, and I sat down and I cried for being alone. Now that isolation was not always, the, and I can't say it was because of the military, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, the military did not create that environment by itself, but it was not an environment that necessarily allowed a lot of things to go on. Um, but since I have uh, was asked to participate in this, I've done a lot of retrospection, introspection, as to um, why I do the work I do. And, uh, you know, that's not always, a, you know, as a lawyer, that's not always something you want to ask yourself. And as an artist, perhaps it's something I should have asked myself a lot more than I have over the years. Um, but I think that my making of Judaica reflects a healing process and a reaching out for a community to give back to a community that uh, I've been subconsciously alienated from or consciously not participating in for many, many years. And, in this sense, I make it the Judaica. Now, I make Judaica, I make the Judaica I want because of the military. I mean, I'm not going to kid anybody. I use the uh, GI Bill just as soldiers did coming back from World War II. And I use my pension to pay the bills. And that allows me to make the things I want, to make the designs I want, and not to have to worry about the marketplace uh, as for, for making it. And um, I think that of all the things I've made over the years, and you know, uh, Emily's been nice enough to allow me to put some items out here. Um, a few years back, the JWB Jewish Chaplains Council, who has responsibility to uh, name chaplains in the military, had a tour for the troops campaign. And, uh, excuse me, the goal of this was to raise enough money to put five small Torahs uh, aboard aircraft carriers in a forward operating locations for Jewish troops. And I told uh, Harold Robinson, the admiral in charge of this, the retired Navy admiral slash rabbi in charge of this, that when I was a lawyer, I had money and no time, and now I have time and no money. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do was make a breastplate for their Torahs, for, the, for one of their Torahs. So I made a breastplate, and here's a photograph of it. It says, Aseret Hadvarot, across the, the top and bottom, the, with the 10 words, and a copy of the, uh, an imagery of the uh, Jewish, of the chaplains, uh, Jewish chaplains sign. I made that, and I made a yad that says Shalom in it. And, um, you know, Shalom means peace, and I grew up in the, in the Strategic Air Command, where, in the era of mutually assured destruction, where our motto in SAC was peace is our profession. And uh, so peace was really the goal. And whether or not we can achieve it is always something that, that's gonna be for generations on. I'm reminded of, of two comments that are relevant to this. One is from Plato that said, uh, only the dead have seen the end of war, and one can hope that he's very wrong. And the other from, uh, 
General Sherman, who uh, said, no man knows the horrors of war more than the soldier, because he has to live it every day. So with that, I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to join you this day, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll be better for it, and I know I have been. Thank you. Hello, sure. this is Ben Rosenthal, my next door neighbor. I'm Katie Nartonis, and I'm so grateful to be a part of today. Um, I've actually had the great pleasure of uh, lecturing in this space before um, for on a different day and a different idea, but this is a hallowed space as far as I'm concerned. It's a place where a lot of beautiful ideas come to uh, join with people who are like-minded. Um, I'm in the 20th century design field. I work in the auction business. I work for Heritage Auctions, which is the third largest auction company in the world. And most of my day is spent about thinking about beautiful things made by hand and how to get them from maybe one family's collection into maybe an institution or uh, maybe uh, the other way around. So I'm very fortunate to work with beautiful things. Um, the reason I'm here today is on a number of levels. Um, I was actually asked to be a part of the Craft in America service episode that aired on PBS last year. I have known Carol and Emily and uh, the gang here for quite a while and I was able to speak a little bit on television about how important the GI Bill was to the arts explosion, uh, especially here on the West Coast. Many of the artists that I tend to uh, uh, serve, to, to, uh, to uh, represent at auction came through the art schools that were talked about a little bit earlier today. And um, we, as, a, as an artistic community, we can see very clearly that there's a, a clear tie between the experiences, especially of World War II, those artists coming back becoming a part of the art scene and an explosion, which um, is still, we're still feeling that today. Well, when that um, lovely episode screened at the LA Library um, last year, I took Ben, my next door neighbor, as my date. And we took the subway, remember? We walked about a million miles uphill to get to the LA right. Library, and this guy was a trip. <laughs> uh, and we got there, and we watched the episode, and it was such a treat. Emily, you were in the panel, and uh, Georgia was there in the audience, and we had a chance to reconnect. Georgia and I have actually uh, known each other for a while as well. And um, when Georgia met Ben, she, w she started sharing this New Directions uh, project that she was working on, and we started talking about the possibility of doing an event. And we decided that my friend Ben Rosenthal was the perfect person to, uh, to include. <laughs> and um, I will tell you, the reason, not only is, is uh, Ben a Jewish vet, and he served in World War II, but he's also one of the most um, lovely people I've ever met. And I think part of that is that he has stayed connected to his roots. And I think what his roots are is that he's truly He's not a musician or an artist himself, but he's a, an appreciator. He's an aficionado. Yeah. Yes, I think you are. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to learn more a little bit about that in a little bit. Uh, first of all, I want to share a picture. Do you want to hold this up? This is Ben Rosenthal when he was uh, 1946. Yeah, good looking yeah. guy. <laughs> 45, sorry. 45. Uh, September, two. right? Right. Right. Okay, September 46, 45, when he was uh, let out of, or pulled out of there. Ooh, like, wow. see it. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. We're the good looking guy. Now that, that, yeah, that's, that's great. around. That's great. That's a box car. That's a box car. It may be, I don't want to talk. All right, well, all right. So let me give you a quick <laughs> background on, on Ben. Born July 22nd, 1919, in Auburn, Maine, to Jewish Lithuanian parents. William and Sarah with three older sisters. True. He moved to Chelsea in Boston, uh, north of, just, it's a city just north of Boston, uh, in 1925, and uh, grew up in uh, Dorchester. Right? right. And you graduated from high school in 1938, and um, when Ben was growing up, he'll tell you more about this in a little bit, he hung around with a lot of kids. He was kind of a hoodlum, actually. And, um, is that right? What? A little bit? You were a little bit of a hoodlum? Well, that was in Chelsea. Well, that was before you came to Dorchester? <clears throat> if we hadn't moved, I wouldn't be here. I'd either be dead or in jail. <laughs> but the, oh, that's how tough it was. It was a tough town, tough kids. Um, tough. But a lot of the kids, I would say at least three of the kids that you grew up with became important jazz musicians. Well, this was in Dorchester. Oh, your Dorchester friends. Dorchester, right. which was about 100% Jewish. 
with one Irish family and one Jewish, one Italian family. And Mrs. Longo spoke Yiddish better than all the Jewish people, <laughs> believe it or not. So tell me about what those kids were like in Dorchester that you well, went with. Well, they played ball every day of the week. Uh, we had a field down where we lived, luckily, at we played baseball, football, and hockey. We didn't play basketball because there wasn't a gym. And uh, growing up that way uh, was really an experience. It was great. And there weren't any automobiles at that time. We walked everywhere. As a result, going in the service, you were not ashamed. Whereas the kids now are out of shape, they don't have any legs. But anyway, uh, these people live next door, the Drutons. Their father was the uh, uncle of Lenny Nimoy. And, uh, Who we just lost, Lenny Nimoy. Right. And they, they sponsored uh, the Drutons, and the Drutons were all musicians. Father was a klezmer clarinet player. If he had stayed in New York, he would have made a fortune. But in Boston, forget about it. And anyway, Al played, uh, what did he play? Oh, alto and clarinet, and later on, tenor and soprano, and flute, and whatever you want to call it. And Buzzy, who was my age, Al was a little older. He's still around. He's about 98. <coughs> was about my age. And uh, we hung around, we went everywhere together. But anyway, he became a drummer. Now, the crazy thing is, here, here he is, my best friend, and I don't know he's a drummer. And he probably took one lesson in his life. And he ended up as a, maybe one of the finest, finest drummers who ever lived. Whether they like it or not, nobody knew him except Billy Holiday and Leslie Young. Did you ever hear Leslie Young? Mm -hmm. No. Toby said yes. Yes, Toby yes. said yes. Yeah. Okay. So your friend... Uh, what do you know about? Um, not very much. I mean, I used to listen to jazz and stuff, but I don't, I don't ever think... Okay. But the name is... Yeah. Leslie Young was the greatest saxophone player of all. And also Louis Armstrong. And uh, in fact, he accompanied... Uh, Billy for a while, they said. He so, was her favorite drummer. So here, here you are, a kid from Boston. Your best friends ended up playing with Billy Holiday and some of the best jazz musicians in the world. But what I'd like to get to a little bit, you were drafted in the Army in 42. Uh, ben yeah. was one of the first, uh, the last rather, to, to train on horseback. Right? True. The last cav cavalry. <laughs> yes. So in Fort Riley, you trained on horseback. And um, then he went overseas, served in Sicily, Italy, France, Germany, and he was actually outside of Dachau uh, concentration camp on the day of liberation in April, today, April 29th, 1945, which is 70 years ago, right? 70 years ago today. Um, and what I'd like you to tell us a little bit about is your experience. We don't have a ton of time, okay. but I'd love for you to read what you brought today, That's and then cool. maybe also talk about how your love of music and the arts has helped to sustain you through these experiences. Through everything. <coughs> okay. And I should read it because I know it. <laughs> I was outside the, the camp in a camp on, in a convoy. Uh, it was a sunny day, and the reason I say that is because People are interviewed about Dachau. They always talk about snow. There was no snow there. They're all my sugar. So anyway, the reason that I was in the convoy was my outfit was guarding division headquarters. And some of the men went in with the general. But the, the worst part of my life was we pulled up, stopped, and I looked out, and I didn't believe what I saw. I saw walking skeletons. I looked at it, and I said, how could 
can you exist? Why? What? And I got to talking with a uh, fellow from Poland. Now, I don't know what language we, we spoke to each other. And he said to me, he said, I've got a story to tell you. He said, you won't believe it. It's a story. He said, came from a little big village in Poland, and the Germans drove a big truck in there and loaded all the Jewish people onto the truck. Took it out to the main road, dumped them off. But what do you think happened next? Seven of bitches. He rode them over with a tank. And I'm looking at that guy. Hey, you know, what is this? Huh? These people, I don't believe it. They were barbarians. Okay, two days later, May 1st, 1945, some of us went into the camp. When we went in, one of the fellows said, if we had seen this sooner, we would have killed every goddamn one of them. And believe me, I still believe that we would have. But anyway, this is where the box cars were. And I stuck my nose in there. In fact, I almost went in there to tell you the truth. I was very curious. I was wondering how many Jews, Jewish faces there were. There weren't too many. If, it, if there is such a thing, which there really isn't. And uh, there was a German guard that guy lying down there, somebody pulled his fingers out. Well, it turns out that a lot of Russian inmates, women, that ripped these Germans in half. I don't blame them, I would have done the same thing. And uh, then I found out that it was in an international camp. And there were a lot of, uh, a lot of French Russians in there. And according to the book I read, the French and the Russians treated the Jews worse than the Germans, and that's something. And to this day, I'll never forget them, son of a bitch. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that, Ben. I know that's um, hard to talk about, but I, what I'd love for you to share a little bit is how you're able to live with those memories. Uh, one of the things I know about my friend Ben is that he's one of the most generous, loving, thoughtful, Wait, right? positive you people believe in the that world. You believe that it's you true. Think. People fall in love with him wherever we go. And um, I love that you have maintained that love of man and humankind and that optimism. And can you share a little bit about why you think, besides your being who you are, why that is? I have no idea. I can't figure it out. There's no way I can figure it out. I'm 95, people say, well, how did you live this long? I don't know. <laughs> I, really, I really don't know. <laughs> There's no formula. It just happened, that's all. But... Uh, what about music and... Uh, <laughs> without music, you can forget about it. If you can't feel music, you might as well be dead. And it seems like every day I wake up, there's music in my head. Mm -hmm. Though I can't read music or anything, and, and it, 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 it's very crazy. I can remember back the, the first time I ever felt any. You remember Rubinoff and his violin with Eddie Cantor? in the 20s, and mm -hmm. <laughs> radio. Okay. <laughs> and I got a chill up and down my spine. How old were you then? I have no idea. Oh, maybe 10 years old. <laughs> and never, never thought of it, you know. But my father and I used to listen to the opera every Saturday. From Metropolitan, Lily Ponds, and I remember. And after the... After listening to that, we listened to the baseball game. You like that? <laughs> now, many years later, my niece told me that she used to sit with my father. And she said, he'd say, they missed a note. 
Now, how do you figure that one out? Now, the crazy thing here is this. Those days, you've never asked me questions. I have no idea about the background of my, my folks. Then I found out my father had been a tuba player in the Russian army. Apparently, he was a blacksmith or something. I still don't know, growing up, what he did, because as, as I said, we never asked him anything. And uh, he, uh, he heard the band across the street. He says, I can do that. In six months, he was playing classical music, too much. But I didn't know that. Now, he used to take me to, to band concerts, but I didn't know why. But I learned to listen to my friends. And the, the one fellow, Al Drew, had a, uh, what do we call it now? What do we call it, the phonograph? Patroller. And all the musicians used to come listen to the records. Now, what happened was I listened with them. And as a result of listening with them, I don't listen like, listen like the ordinary person. Because they would play a, a chorus time after time till they got it. And as a result of that, I don't know, I learned how to listen. It's in your blood. I don't know what it's in. You think it's in blood? I think blood. it's in your blood. It sounds like it, there's a musical there's, gift that runs in your family. There's something, something in there. It must be, must be music way, way back. Do you mind opening up the book for a couple of questions? I'll open up to any <laughs> Does anyone I'll have any questions for him? Yes. So, did the American Army, the Americans, you were, you were outside of Dachau and, and you had this experience when you went in. Yeah, right. So the army, the, the, the military, American soldiers such as yourself, you had no idea that this no, was going on? No, no, none whatsoever. In fact, the, the uh, camp was liberated my, by my division. Now, to this day, there must be 10 million outfits that say they liberated their guy. And I, I started in with all this baloney in about 1991. I read an article in the newspaper about the Japanese Americans liberated that. I went crazy. I called a radio station, a TV station, called the Times, wrote them a letter, nothing. I went down to the Museum of Tolerance. And I had a monogram by the Colonel Sparks, who had liberated the camp. And I had called them and I said, who liberated Dachau? They said, the Japanese. One of them was sugar there, though. So, so anyway, I went down there, I had the monograph. And I remember the two slightly large people there, and, and uh, I, I asked them again, who liberated the camp? They said, the Japanese. I gave them the monograph. What did they do with it? They threw it in the cabinet drawer. They said, well, we'll check with Washington. In the first place, why didn't they check with the archives? Because what happened, with my outfit, we were a reconnaissance outfit. We were ahead of anybody, everybody. And we had one platoon out on the, maybe it was the 28th. And I was curious, I, I wanted to know, did anybody get into Dachau by any chance? The, and the crazy thing is that being a reconnaissance troop, we were the eyes and ears of the 45th Division, and uh, if we were not guarding Division Headquarters, would we have been the first ones in there? It's possible. <coughs> you never know with the Army. They're almost sugar anyway. And uh, 
But I, I sent to Washington to the archives. Well, and they said, no, 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 but you weren't near there. But uh, we didn't know anything. Nobody told anybody anything. The colonel who liberated the camp, they didn't know. And they went in there and they cleaned it out pretty fast. And they shot, they killed a few of the guards. And um, according to the Geneva Convention, you're not supposed to do that. Listen, if I had my way, I would have killed every goddamn one of them. I mean, you, you just don't realize what they did. Now, how can you figure these people out? Now, these were the civilized people in Europe, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Growing up, what did I hear? That, that Russia and Poland were the bad. Poland was supposed to be the most anti-Semitic country in the world. And here's, here's Germany, the, in, they intermarried and all that, and they were supposedly civilized. Bunch of sugar, I'm telling you. Boy, 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 boy. But nevertheless, what the hell? Life is here, I'm still here. You wake up with a song in your heart, and the world is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> Remember that. That is my conclusion. You want to ask a question? I, I, it's so hard to follow that because that is the perfect <laughs> ending. Uh -huh. That's the perfect ending. But I wanted to ask how music. Did you did you have access to music while you were serving? Do you have any memories? You know, it's very funny, very funny, very odd. But let's see. Season July. It wasn't. July 43, okay, we went overseas. And then in about uh, maybe March of 44, I was in a little village in Italy, on uh, one street, and there was a signal company over here, and, and they had a sign that uh, Ella Logan and the Andrews sisters, Mm -hmm. to appear. I said, they're crazy. I was getting downbeat. I knew the Andrews sisters were in the United States. Truck comes around the corner. Some guy yells, Apples. That's my nickname. That's my nickname for Boston. And who is it? It's a friend of mine, a trumpet player. And he's in the Fifth Army All-American Band. And they were appearing there. It was crazy. So what, what happened was this. <laughs> Lieutenant and myself didn't get along. Well, I don't know. Well, anyway, he used to go to Anzio to pay, pay the troops. And I would take off. And I would go to Caserta, which was near Naples. But that, I didn't know at that time that where we were, all the supplies were around there, the quartermaster. And I would go and I would stay with them and listen to music. But we had no radios. I was in the rear, we had no radios. And up front, in my, my outfit, we were communication, so we had them scout cars. And I remember one day, uh, I, I'm not going to tell you that story. But any, anyway, you know, we turned the radio on. Somebody uh, request for me. And, and that happened. And later on, uh, I don't know, from Paris, the same thing, a request for me. I don't know who that was. Mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine who was uh, with Jimmy McPartland's band. And I had this drummer. And I understand he was looking all over Europe for me, and he couldn't find me. <laughs> my mother passed away, and my she couldn't get me home. The Red Cross said, we can't find him. Can't find him. They said, we're plastered all over the jump. <laughs> now, I made a big mistake. I should have gone to the captain and asked him whether I could. Now, the reason I say that is this. One fellow, his, uh, who 
wife lost a leg. Red Cross won't let him go home. So I went to the captain. I'm a company clerk. I went to the captain. I said, Captain? He says, Get him out of here. And another fellow, something else. And here I am, years later, and I said to myself, What am I, the sugar? Why the hell did I ask? Why didn't I ask you? Why didn't I ask the captain? My captain turned out he was a regular army captain. He was friendly with generals. And uh, one, one day in, in Italy, uh, here comes a general. Now you don't do that, you know, general's going to show up, hey. He said, eh, don't worry, he was a friend of his. And he was a friend of his. Jesus, how did he do that? What do you think? Well, I think that's pretty good. We're going to wrap this up pretty soon, but I want to open it up to any more questions. And of course, you, I think everybody, if you want to talk to Ben or uh, get his number, he'd love to chat with you more about it. Why not? I'll tell you all kinds of stuff. Thank you so much, Bill. And what a beautiful... Thank you. Uh,